The following is the presentation of the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion. All content presented is the exclusive intellectual property of CCDI. Any sharing, reproduction, or use of this material or content as is, or in any form, requires the express written permission of CCDI. Should you wish to use this content in any way, please contact Anne-Marie Pham, CEO at the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion at annemariefam at ccdi.ca. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Andrea Dillingham LaCourcier. I'm a manager of partner relations here at CCDI. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'll be moderating today's chat web on the webinar, Anti-Semitism and How to Recognize and Prevent It in the Workplace. We have a live interpretation available for this webinar. You can enable this feature by clicking on the interpretation button and choosing the language channel of your choice. Please note a quick disclaimer. CCDI is not liable for any claims, losses, or damages of any kind arising out of or in any way related to the information provided in this presentation. As you can see, we have many webinars coming up, which you can register for at ccdi.ca. CCDI is celebrating its 10 year anniversary, and it's the perfect time to pause and reflect on Canada's progress towards equity, diversity, and inclusion, and envision together a better future. This year at CCDI's Unconference, we will pause, reflect, and project. We will pause to reflect on what changes we have seen over the last decade of DEI work within our communities, and then collectively envision what comes next. What are the future trends of DEI, and how can we as practitioners and community members actively contribute to build a sustainable and equitable Canada. To register for the conference, please visit ccdi.ca backslash unconference. Canadian Certified Inclusion Professional Certification is a professional designation designed to assess the knowledge and experience of diversity and inclusion professionals against the standard set of predefined competencies. For more information, visit ccdi.ca slash CCIP or email ccip.certification at ccdi.ca. The next cohort registration closes on March 7th. Thank you again for joining us and we'll now get started. I'll pass it over to my colleague and friend Skylar, Manager of Partner Relations at CCDI to take the conversation from here. Let's unmute first. Before we get into the agenda for today, I'd like to open this webinar by honoring the land from which I speak to you. Though this webinar is brought to you virtually, we are each situated on land that is old and storied. It is important for us to acknowledge this. To do so, I'd like to open today's session by honoring the land upon which we gather today. I acknowledge and honor the traditional territories of the Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. I'd like to pay homage to the Indigenous peoples, past, present, and future that can continue to work educate and contribute to the strength of this country. If you would like to learn more about the history, traditions and stories of the land upon which you live, I highly recommend checking out the Who's Land app to learn more. The link should be in the chat. And why do we make land acknowledgements? A land acknowledgement is an act of reconciliation that involves making a statement recognizing the traditional territories of the Aboriginal peoples and the lands upon which they live. It can also be the beginning or continuation of your learning journey about Aboriginal peoples and the history of colonialism that continues to impact community relations across Canada. Territorial acknowledgements show recognition and respect of the land of the First Peoples on whose land we live and work. Acknowledgements are essential to establishing healthy reciprocal relations and must be meaningful in building relationships and ensuring the work towards reconciliation is ongoing. This is why we make acknowledgements a vital part of our work. A little bit about me. I'm a certified inclusion professional, uh, Canadian cer uh, certified Canadian inclusion professional with a background of intercultural communications, uh, studying how different groups of people communicate across various media. 
I've worked in politics, social media, nonprofit, and educational institutions. I've worked in the 2S LGBTQ+, and the Jewish community, and their various intersections for almost 20 years now. And I've worked with the CCDI as a partnership manager in Atlantic Canada for the last year. This webinar will focus on three topics related to Jew hate and anti-Semitism. We will cover what anti-Semitism is, how to incorporate these lessons into your DEI work, and give you some practical solutions for fighting anti-Semitism in the workplace. To accomplish this, we have reached out to some of the leading uh, organizations when it comes to fighting anti-Semitism in Canada, and we're pleased to introduce our panel of experts. Shiva Berhanu, is the Associate Director of Partnerships for the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs. A Canadian Ethiopian Jewish activist, she focuses on combating anti-Semitism and hate by working with other ethno-religious and civil society groups on issues of shared concern. Uh, Ziv is the manager of EDI training and liaison to the LGBTQ plus community for CJA and holds a Master of Arts from York University, where they research the trajectory of medieval anti-Semitic anti perceptions to modern literary anti-Semitism, specifically in children's fantasy literature. They find it important to educate about anti-Semitism and who the Jewish people are. Jody is the director uh, Jody Spiegel is the Director of Holocaust Survivor Memoirs Program at the Azraeli Foundation. This national program publishes written testimonies of Holocaust survivors who immigrated to Canada after the war. Since 2005, they have produced over 120 survivor stories available in English and French. Jody has been a Canadian delegate of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the IHRA, since 2014, and sits on the Committee on Anti-Semitism and Holocaust Denial uh, on the Committee uh, in 2022. Jody chaired the IHRA's Education Working Group. So now we'll get into the initial questions here. And let me stop sharing my screen and open it up to our panelists here. And I, the very first question that I would like to ask is, um, what is anti-Semitism? And I'll start with, with Jody here um, uh, to, to begin, then we'll go around in a circle. Thank you, Skylar. Um, I'm gonna begin, first of all, thank you for including me and in having this important discussion. I know it's uh, really difficult and I think it's quite commendable um, to, to be having this talk today. So I want to talk about the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or I'll refer to it as the IRA. So the IRA is a group of countries that come together to promise to uphold the Stockholm Declaration, which is the founding document of the IRA that pledges a commitment from these countries. And there are over 34 countries now who have committed to Holocaust education, commemoration, research, while working to combat anti-Semitism. As we know, anti-Semitism didn't disappear at the end of the Holocaust, and so fighting anti-Semitism requires a common understanding so we can lead to a cooperative effort. And so in 2016, the IRA adopted a working definition of anti-Semitism, and that's the definition that I'm going to share today. Um, and we know since 2016, over a thousand global entities have endorsed it, including the province of Alberta, the city of Vancouver, and just last week, uh, the city of Richmond. British Columbia. So the IRA definition has generated open public dialogue on the problem of anti-Semitism. And at its core, the definition states that anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews, rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals, their property, the Jewish community, institutions, or religious facilities. It does not define who an anti-Semite is or who a Jew is. Instead, it talks about certain manifestations. It focuses on form to allow for dialogue, that is conversation about conscious or unconscious expression. And because it's not always evident, the IRA has definitions, 11 examples to support the definition so that you can identify an overall context. These are not rigid classifications, and they don't identify all types of anti-Semitism, but it's an internationally accepted baseline so that we can shine a light and start a conversation. So hating Jews because of policies of the state of Israel is anti-Semitism. However, criticism of Israel, similar to any 
criticism leveled against any other country cannot be regarded as anti-Semitic. Not saying you can't criticize Israel, you can ask any Israeli, but there are legitimate grounds to comment on any state policy. But it's clear sometimes we know that certain rhetoric will cross the line from being legitimate to trafficking in tropes. This definition does not call for prescribed speech and does not seek to protect any group from reasonable criticism. I'd like to just note that the IRA definition is not a political or legal weapon. It's an educational resource. And it allows us to begin a conversation about mutual respect. And it's one step in a longer path towards developing an information-based approach to countering anti-Semitism, um, which my colleagues here at the IRA do, and as well at CJA. So I'd like to turn it over to them. Excellent. I would, uh, I'll open up to either Ziv or Shiva um, to continue the conversation. Okay. Um, I mean, it was a great explanation, Jody. Thank you for that. I, we use the IRA definition here at CJ when we educate about anti-Semitism as well, because it is a very comprehensive definition that assists with people understanding and having a foundation to have the conversation about anti-Semitism. You can't have a conversation about anti-Semitism without an understanding of what it is. And the IRA definition does a good job of making it understandable to people who may not have ever experienced anything to do with anti-Semitism or have various ideas of what may or may not constitute as anti-Semitism. And it helps with being able to understand when you're looking at something that's anti-Semitic because IRA helps with making that foundation for you. And one other thing that I want to add is that I think that it's important to remember the way in which anti-Semitism's definition has is, is changed over time, but ultimately comes back to blaming Jews for societal ills at any given point, be it um, rendering Jews as kind of a religious other, a racial other, a political other. Uh, this process of, of othering the Jew is, is essentially what the root um, definition of anti-Semitism comes back to, but has changed throughout time. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I would like to, to ask now, uh, how has anti-Semitism evolved over time? Uh, how has it shown up in the past and how does that affect how it shows up now? Um, I guess I can talk about that a bit because um, a lot of my research was specifically in medieval anti-Semitism, which is one of the ways that is probably the largest influencer in how we've seen anti-Semitism develop today um, with specifically religious anti-Semitism coming out of Middle Ages, where there were lots of laws for um, Jews that, um, I'm not sure if you're having trouble hearing me still. I tried to adjust my, okay, <laughs> we're good now. I'm a very soft speaker, I'm sorry. Uh, so there were lots of laws in the, in the Middle Ages about what Jews were allowed to do and what they were not allowed to do. There was a lot of perceptions of Jews that made foundations for how people view Jews today and how anti-Semitism is manifesting today. For example, there's blood libel, which is where Jews are accused of murdering Christian children in order to use their blood for esoteric magic, for making matzah for Passover, for increasing their longevity of lives. Like there's a lot that goes within blood label and we've seen that become a thing today that people continue to accuse Jews of. There's of course the entire idea of Jews being very wealthy and controlling the banks. And that comes from where there were edicts against Christians actually dealing with bursary. And so they couldn't do that at all. And then Jews were only really allowed to do certain jobs anyway. And one of them was dealing with loans. So when you had a person who owed money to their landlord, to their Lord, to whatever it was at the time, the person coming to collect would be Jewish. And so you end up with this perception that the Jew was coming for your money. And that continues today. Um, we even in Canada, we, we are not without our own history of anti-Semitism here. Um, it's not maybe as well researched or, well, it is pretty well researched, but like well known about as European anti-Semitism, but you may or may not know that this year is the 90th anniversary of the Christie Pitts riot, 
which was the largest race riot in Canada. Um, it is in August this year. Um, so there's a lot that's going on with conversations about that. That was a riot that happened in 1933 in Toronto, Ontario. And it was where the, um, the Nazi youth, um, I don't recall exactly what they called themselves at the time, were constantly getting into spats with um, the Jewish and the Italian immigrants who lived in um, the annex and around Kensington Market and around Christie Pitts here. And it all came to the head one evening in 1933 when they were playing baseball in the uh, pit there. And it was, I believe it lasted until well into the morning. So that's just one example. There was, of course, you may or may not have heard of the, uh, this, the one is too many, or sorry, none is too many, which comes from when the MS St. Louis was trying to dock here in Canada. It actually successfully docked in the United States and, and gotten rid of, gotten rid of, that's a terrible way to say that, had been able to have a number of refugees um, live in the United States from there. But when they tried to get everyone to be able to dock there, they weren't allowed to have everyone get off of a boat. These people were coming from Europe. They were escaping um, likely death. And when they were refused to let everyone off of the boats there and refused once they came up to Canada to let anyone off, they were forced to go back to Europe and uh, many of the, the Jews that were on the boats were then sent to the camps and murdered in the Holocaust. And aside from these very violent examples of Canadian anti-Semitism, if you look into archives of anti-Semitism in Canada, you will see many signs about like no Jews allowed in um, various cottage country areas, in various community pools, um, there was a newspaper that was the Canadian Nationalist, which was publishing in Winnipeg in 1937, that was publishing anti-Semitic content. Like, it's not something that we have pictures of fully for everything. These are just examples of signs. These are examples of publications. Um, Jews were not allowed to have certain jobs in Canada for a while. It was difficult for Jews to get jobs as doctors, as lawyers. Many restaurants, many hotels, many shops would, re would refuse service to Jews. Um, many Jewish people would just flat out face discrimination in employment of not being, even if it wasn't like a rule for the employer all across the board with um, universities not employing Jews, but just day to day, like, oh, we're not going to have any Jews, Gentiles only sort of we sign. We've seen that like in the past from like quotas from different universities and how many Jews they would allow in. And that sort of thing has evolved. Like now uh, we see a lot of it coded in cultural um cultural touchstones where where you see Jews as coded as as because they were forced into these jobs of of money um, by Christian nations they were um, often were often uh, perceived to be wealthy or uh, managing the banks or, or behind the scenes um, which comes out a lot in in culture and and television and movies these days I mean the reason why you think that or that people think that Jews own Hollywood is that one of the few jobs Jews were allowed to do when Hollywood was beginning was to work in Hollywood as directors and actors and writers. The reason why Jews are in a lot of Jews are in certain areas is because these are the jobs that we were allowed to take part in. And so then you end up just working in a place where you know you can get a job. Um, so that's just kind of a brief overview for some of the history of anti-Semitism. It is very wide. Um, deep pool that you can do research in, unfortunately, but um, it's it's definitely something that we've seen because of these perceptions of Jews and because of these attitudes towards Jews, this is what has influenced why people think of Jews a certain way today and why anti-Semitism is still able to flourish today. I get, I'll pass it off to, to Sheba now. Do you have any um, any comments on on how anti-Semitism manifests uh, around your life or around the community in which you live? Well, I think Steve gave a great overview of kind of some of the historical manifestations of it. But I think that personally, the way that the way that I live and in the places that I live, anti-Semitism, because I exist in a in a body that most people wouldn't often classify as, as being Jewish, and that's part of, of kind of the problem is that we have this idea of anti of, of the Jew as being um, a white person or a person that comes from Eastern Europe. And, and so often we don't, 
we don't know that um, the Jewish identity um, encompasses people from, from, from Asia, from Africa, from South America, that the Jew, uh, the Jewish person is, um, is not often who we, who we think it to be. So, so it's, it's just another manifestation of anti-Semitism that, that often allows us to believe that, that anti-Semitism is punching up because we can believe that it's a white person that we're talking about, even though that, that doesn't render it to be punching up. It's just a, a way in which the manifestation exists. So um, this idea of a Jewish person as being white, um, as being wealthy, we, we know that this comes again from underlying manifestations, but that's just one of the ways that it comes up in my life. And we, we see that a lot uh, across uh, all things. And, you know, currently in Canada, anti-Semitism is the second most common form of hate, uh, yeah. which has- We make up yeah. less than 1% of the population, yet we make up 14% of religiously motivated hate crimes, uh, making Jewish Canadians the number one target of religiously motivated hate crimes. The overrepresentation um, speaks volumes. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons why uh, this this webinar, in fact, was moved up um, because of all the the anti-Semitism, the increase over the pandemic. A lot of uh, I found stickers in Halifax blaming the pandemic on on Jews, and you you see that across the country. A lot of people picking up on the anti-Asian hate, the anti-Jewish hate over uh, events like this, and uh, so that's one of the reasons why we set this webinar to be both free and to be uh, more recent or closer to uh, that we, we moved it up was because of the importance uh, and the uh, sheer amount of hate there is online, in person, and out in the world. Um, I'll use that to, to segue into our, our uh, second sort of group uh, conversation is um, what are some of the ways in which we can incorporate anti-Semitism into DEI work as, as we uh, are working on it today? and uh, Shiva, I'll send that one to you uh, first this time. Well, I think going back to what I, I, I just said is understanding the process of, or at least the role that race plays um, in Jewish identity, understanding that Jews were racialized, um, whether we're talking about, you know, the, we're talking about the Holocaust, where the Jew in Eastern Europe was rendered to be a separate race uh, and deemed undesirable, containing a series of, of traits that render them a different race, um, or whether we're recognizing that, you know, um, Jews from Arab lands, Jews from different places in the world don't make up the idea of, of what a Jewish person is. This understanding of Jewish identity is, I think, kind of... Um, the first step in, 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 in bringing Jews into, um, into DEI work uh, and understanding what Jewish identity means beyond practice or ethnicity, uh, that it can look like cultural, uh, like a, it, that, it can, that it is a culture, right? That one can practice certain holidays or choose to abstain from participating in them, that certain dietary restrictions um, may be present or they may not be. And understanding that one's affiliation or proximity to, to their Jewish identity doesn't necessarily uh, render them to be anything other than just a Jew. And we see that in, in Judaism, like um, it's not just a religion, it's not just an ethnicity, it's not just a culture, it's it's some sort of combination of all three. And uh, the discrimination comes from all three areas as well. Um, Jody? I want to jump on what Shiva was saying about the understanding um, in the workplace and just in society that there's no, there's no one to say, oh, you don't look Jewish or to as assume a certain look, a certain way of being. Like you said, Judaism, is, to be a Jew is, to, is an ethno-culture. There's no way to look like a Jew and there's no way to practice. There's, you know, there's a range and there's no other um, place to understand that except to, when it comes to looking at it from an anti-Semitic lens. If there's a pre if there's a, a pre-existing idea in your head of what something is supposed to be, that we know is that bias, right? So you don't look so-and-so, you don't look like this, 
is your own bias or some misunderstanding that is, you've come across that needs to be fixed and repaired. There also needs to be an understanding that what we were drawing on before about examples over time of what anti-Semitism is, is how we understand things. And so like, the, like was shared earlier in the Holocaust, we, it was about race. It was a discussion about race. And so, you know, the Jews were the lowest race at a certain point it's it's the idea that whatever society's ills whatever the problem is the jew is at fault and that's why during covid the jew, it was a jewish there was this jewish um conspiracy there was a theory conspiracy theories and ideas around the ideas of the jewish link to this you know um now whiteness is considered something that is as fault. We really work hard to understand a variety of different cultures and ethnicities and understanding. And so the Jew is white. And there's, I think there may have been a question um, from in, in the chat about asking about that, but the idea of the white Jew allows for that um, notion that my colleague was sharing about punching up and punching down. You're not gonna talk about somebody who is in a, poor, um, in a lesser socioeconomic or um, something, the idea of, of beating down on somebody is a lot harder to take when you're a bully than when you're beating up and talking about those who are privileged. And so putting the Jew as something and someone who is privileged is a lot easier for everyone to get behind than picking on the little guy. And that's sort of where that shift happened in in society also, as we get further away from the understanding that Jewish people are a people, where the Hebrew word is am, um, we're a nation. And being a nation, we're made up of many different types of backgrounds and, and looks, and we can't fit into a box, as uncomfortable as that may be for other people. See you. Um, well, to talk about it in terms of EDI, because um, I think we've done some really good conversation here about how to understand what it is to be Jewish and how we are a culture, we're a religion, we're an ethnicity. Um, by speaking about it in this way also is kind of making our conversation work within like a Christian mindset, because it is Christianity that made us understand that religion and culture uh, can be separated. Um, it, it, it's very, you, you can't, it's, it's part of your culture. That's just what that is. So understanding that you might have internal biases like that, which is so minimal, it's so small. You might not ever think of it that way, that there are others within your head. Like if you, you there's so many, <laughs> I can't even think of more examples right now, sorry, um, that you just might have to be willing to confront when someone mentions it to you um, without being on the defensive. So for example, with working with looking at anti-Semitism in the workplace, there's a lot of there's a lot of articles about this right now because there's been a lot of people talking about anti-Semitism in general and then talking about how do we deal with this in the workplace. For example, there's people who talk about how just bringing up that something was anti-Semitic, they went to their their manager and their manager was like, oh, well, just ignore it. We just want to have a nice environment here. We don't want to have to deal with this kind of conversation. That's an example of anti-Semitism, right? Like you need to be able to face and deal with when there are conflicts in your space. It may not be, maybe that person isn't the right person that should be reported to. But if you go to your higher level report and they come back to you with something like that, that's inappropriate. And there needs to be an area where you can go and report to someone else, like go maybe to HR or go to their manager or whatever. Or um, I know someone who wanted to have their company uh, say something about International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which just happened. And they got um, a response that was saying that they don't acknowledge any religious holidays. And that's not a religious holiday, that is a Memorial Day. So understanding that there's kind of a difference within how we conceptualize our religious holidays as Jews, but also International Holocaust Remembrance Day isn't actually a Jewish holiday regardless. It's an International Remembrance Day. So just being aware of that. But when it comes to like your employees, when it comes to your um, coworkers, 
if you are in an instance and someone says something like, oh, um, you know, you're, you're careful with your money because you're Jewish, speaking up against that and saying, oh, what are you, what are you talking about? When you see someone say that to a coworker is what's important. Speaking up against anti-Semitism is what's important. If you don't feel like you can say it in that moment, but you can be a witness is also important. Being an active witness to something can be very helpful if it feels like you're not in a safe space when an incident happens, but you can go and speak to the person that it happened to and be like, I will stand with you if you wanna report this or I'm willing to report this for you can be very helpful. Depending on Jews to constantly be the people who stand up against anti-Semitism will not lead to comprehensive change. We are such a small percentage of the population that if we are the ones that are demanded upon to make these changes happen, they really aren't going to happen. We need the help of our allies to do that. So when it comes to say, you want to, you want a new job or something, and you're looking at a job, looking at what their uh, policies are about religious accommodations can be a really good way to see if they're an employer that will be an ally to you as a Jewish person or as a Muslim person or as a Sikh is a good way to understand how good they are with EDI, just straight up. That's a very minimal area, but it's very much something that can be lacking. So how do they deal with religious accommodation? How do they deal with their, what are their anti-discrimination and anti-harassment policies? Do they have examples of doing diversity trainings? Have any of the diversity trainings had to do with anti-Semitism? Because in a lot of EDI trainings, anti-Semitism is overlooked because again, we are determined to be people who are of privilege. So what is there to train about? What is there to learn about when it comes to anti-Semitism? Unfortunately, there's a lot. Um, that's what I do. So thinking about how to look at a place you wanna work for looking at all of these things, but also as an employer, as a manager, as an HR representative, what does your company do for these things? Um, does your company have employee resource groups for faith-based resource groups for interfaith or specifically Jewish or any other faith? Like these are ways to show that you are open to being an ally to Jews and to support your Jewish employees. So those are just a few examples. <laughs> And we're, we will come back to the signpost policies because that's something I want to talk about uh, when we do talk about things we can do now. Um, but I wanted I wanted to grab in on this part uh, for allyship because what does it mean to be an ally to the Jewish community, to to the communities in general, uh, and finding um, that balance of when you see anti-Semitism, call it out. Um, when you're when you're when you reach out to someone and say, you know, I felt anti-Semitism at work, listen, don't, don't go on and, and, you know, don't ignore it. Don't say that it's not happening. Don't give examples where you're, you know, good in other areas. Just listen. Um, and I'm not sure how does allyship um, to you mean something um, different or, or I'll, I'll, I'll leave, I'll open this again to, to, to Jody and Chiba, but uh, do you have any uh, good examples of like things that you can do uh, uh, against like micro or macro um, aggressions, things that, uh, you know, that you would like for um, allyship wherever you're working? I think a really important thing when it comes to allyship is doing some reading on being an active witness. Um, because that's really a place where you can be very helpful um, if there's an incident. When it comes to, there isn't an incident in the immediacy, right? Like maybe not in your workplace, but maybe there's conversations about stuff happening out in the world. Um, like there have been recently quite a few different incidents that could be happening. Um, in conversation, bring people bring up, instead of coming to a conversation where someone might be talking about, say, a celebrity or um, a franchise that you might hold dear to your heart with defensiveness, um, listen. <laughs> listen to the people who know um, what this sort of hatred can look like and be open to hearing about it. When someone is talking about something being anti-Semitic or something being hateful, they're not saying that you enjoying this means you are a bad person. They're saying that these things are hurtful. They can cause violence. They can cause um, people to feel outside outside of where they are. These are these are not um, like if some if I'm talking about 
something is anti-Semitic in, say, this thing that you really enjoy. I'm not saying that you enjoying it is bad. I'm saying that you should be aware that these things are anti-Semitic within this. That is, um, I think, a very, very, very low bar for an ally to be able to cross. Unfortunately, it is one that quite a few people who like to think of them as allies, themselves as allies, have failed at crossing um, recently. And so it's important to be just aware that it's not about you when someone is talking about something being anti-Semitic, unless it is saying, hey, that thing that you said, um, that's a little anti-Semitic. So just, just maybe, I think it's very important when you're talking about hatred um, and people being hated against to remember that we're not at war with each other. We're all trying to be a community. And that's a very important part of allyship. And I'll just, I'll just pick up there. Sorry about that. I just popped out and I am back. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I think that um, including Jews in, in anti-racism work is, is so important, both when we're talking about the movements in which anti-Semitism exists and whether we're talking about white supremacy um, or whether we're, we're kind of um, checking, asking Jews to check uh, a part of themselves at the door. I think that that's, um, that's kind of a key, a key way to demonstrate allyship. Excellent. So we, we've been talking a little bit about um, Jews being more than just uh, a religion, so, and a, more than just uh, a culture. So uh, I'd like to ask, what is the difference between a Jew, a Zionist, and an Israeli? Does that make a difference in how we go about this work? Uh, I'll open that up to whoever wants to answer that first. Yeah, well, I, well, a Jew is, is someone who identifies both as ethnically Jewish or as someone who practices the religion. A Zionist is, is someone who um, identifies with the movement for uh, the self-determination of uh, Jewish people to return to their ancestral homeland, um, Israel. And an Israeli is... Um, a uh, citizen of, of the state or a national of the state. Excellent. And my next question, then going back to some of the, the um, incorporating into DEI work, how do you, um, how would you recommend someone who's facing hesitancy to address anti-Semitism in the office or in the workplace? How would you, what are some things that you can suggest to that person for moving anti-Semitism work forward? Well, I think that often there's a hesitancy to even approach anti-Semitism because of the conflation with Zionism, but it's important to remember that, that, that Zionism is, is baked into, into Judaism. If you were to walk into a synagogue and pick up a sea door, you would find prayers for the well-being of Israel. So this this kind of desire to separate the two um, kind of glosses over the fact that it's baked into Shabbat weekly prayers and 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 Passover and Passover prayers. Um, so it's often kind of held as a metric for whether Jews can participate. Um, but it it doesn't mean you can't advocate for for a Palestinian state or the well-being of Palestinian people. Those are not mutually exclusive things. Like I mentioned before, it's the, it's the desire for return to an ancestral homeland. It's it's a call for the return to the, the linkages that we know based on archaeological um, findings. So it's, and, and, and like I said, it's baked into the faith. So this desire to kind of separate the two and, and the fear of kind of, of, of making one statement by broaching the topic of anti-Semitism is, is a fear that I, I recognize and I see, but I think that, like I mentioned before, Jews can't be asked whether they can participate or not based on their affiliation with something that is so core to the identity. Also, that is a conversation of, are you a good Jew or a bad Jew? Which is inherently anti-Semitic. Um, in a conversation with someone who is hesitant with bringing up anti-Semitism because of the issues that Shiva is talking about, um, making them understand 
that it is something that's core to our identity. But also when you're talking about anti-Semitism, you aren't necessarily talking about Israel and its policies. The way that people talk about Israel can be anti-Semitic. When they compare Israelis to um, saying that they are using Palestinian blood to make the vaccine or whatever it was that happened during the pandemic, um, that's an example of blood bell, or um, using Palestinian blood to make matzah. Again, blood bell. Like there's a lot of blood bell in criticism of Israel. So just don't do that. Um, there's a twofold reason for not doing that. It's not only that you're being anti Semitic by using ancient anti Semitic tropes to try and make your point, by relying on hateful tropes to try and bring attention to what is going on with Palestine and Palestinians, you are making your own argument worse. You are making your own argument something that people can't take seriously. If you can use information that's actually factual and true, you have an actual argument. You have stuff to bring to attention. But if you want to say that it's the Jews' fault that these things are happening, and you want to say it's the Israelis' fault that these things are happening, as a substitute for the Jews, you're, you're making your own conversation more muddled and it makes it harder to have any sort of conversation about how do we deal with this conflict? How do we deal with what's going on? Um, and if the reason why someone might be hesitant to bring up anti-Semitism has nothing to do with Israel and Palestine, but it might be more have to do with, well, you know, Jews are fine in Canada. Like, what are you talking about? Why are you complaining? Bringing up, we have <laughs> the statistics of hate crimes. We have um, what's happening in the news with what's going on in the U.S., with what's going on with various um, conversations about IPs. Um, it, it's, it, there's evidence for why this is a conversation that is very topical, and it's, there's evidence for why this is a conversation that should be happening. Um, if it's something that is difficult, it's something that we still have to talk about. Jody? I wanted to just add also to what Ziv was saying, the idea that what about ism, that when you talk about um, bringing up anti-Semitism doesn't take away from anybody else or anything else in terms of groups. We are given this space to talk about this it, for DEI and spaces like that. This is the space to discuss this. And so to talk about Jewish hatred or anti-Semitism or anti-Zionism, which is sometimes a modern manifestation of anti-Semitism, we can't be afraid to talk about it. And it doesn't put shade on other groups. I feel like there tends to be the idea that, well, if you're a Zionist, then you have to be anti-Palestinian. You could be a Zionist who believes in the state of Israel should exist, the sovereign homeland for the Jewish people, and a sovereign homeland for the Palestinian people. There's, as Shiba was saying, there's no reason to not mutually exclusive. And I think the fear around discussions that when people then say, oh, it's okay, we're going to talk about the Holocaust to check the box on DEI and talking about um, the, you know, Jewish hate. Like it's not something that's happening today, because if we talk about it happening today, then what about and what if we talk about Israel and how do we talk about Israel? And I don't want to make people uncomfortable. Well, I think not having the conversation is what makes people uncomfortable and not answering the questions or saying, you know what, my experience was this and I don't know enough about that and I need to learn more. Or there are these opinions, but throwing the whole conversation out because of fear allows us not to move forward. And I think just, you know, we had talked about this before, Skylar, the idea that, um, you know, if you disagreed with the policies of the Chinese government, and then you boycotted your local Chinese restaurant, I don't know what impact that would make on the Chinese government. So I think the idea of doing that in, let's say, the Israeli context, where people are boycotting certain Israeli institutions, or organizations here in Canada, who often, you know, just like a person trying to make a living as a political statement becomes that's where the problems lie is that when we turn everything into the geopolitical and not the personal because if anything especially in DEI in the workplace where you go every day that is the personal 
And if we tend to push that aside for fear, we're going to we're going to make everything worse. Exactly. I 100 percent agree. Um, my my general rule of thumb, uh, if you want to criticize Israel, criticize the government of Israel, but don't blame uh, the Jew next door because we're in Canada. We're Canadians. That's basically it. Um, so I love the, the your analogy there, Jody. Uh, I am going to shift gears again and pop us into the, the last section. Um, but what are some of the things that employers can do now? What are some policies you might look for at an employer, some like low hanging fruit? What's the easiest thing an employer can do to show you that they actually care uh, and that they are respectful of, uh, of uh, the Jewish community? <clears throat> I'll open uh, Sheba, did you wanna? Ziv mentioned some great, um, some great low hanging fruit in that inquiring about religious accommodations um, being a great one. Uh, also, um, understanding if in the religious accommodations are there is there room for shifting hours within a week? Because uh, another practice of, of Judaism is is Shabbat, which can follow the sun on Friday, meaning it'll start earlier or later. And is an employer willing to kind of allow you to start earlier so that you can work around that on Friday. Um, so again, just kind of as an employer willing to understand the role that it may play in your life. I don't know if anyone has any others. Um, I think that making sure that there's guidance about what is inappropriate speech and um, when it comes to, you know, talking to each other, to posting on Slack or Teams or whatever your company uses. Um, and just making sure that there's kind of clear guidelines about hate speech and content that involves anti-Semitism, because unfortunately a lot of people um, don't include anti-Semitism in their personal definitions of hate speech. Um, so looking for that as well as the other things that I had mentioned earlier, um, I think is a good way to kind of tell how an employer might be accommodating and welcoming to Jewish employees. Um, one thing that, that I can say um, is check, checking your um, your booklet of what, what benefits do you have. Uh, is it possible to shift, um, say, your Christmas day off to a Jewish holiday so that you can take that time off? Because there are a lot of periods like Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Passover, the fast days that you may want to take off as a Jew that you would normally have to use vacation for. Uh, so do you have flex work policies for that kind of thing? Can I work overtime so I can take those days off? Can I do um, other things? So when you're looking at these policies in your book, you don't have to talk to a person to know that that this workplace is, is accepting and has made those uh, accommodations already before you even get there. So like for signpost policies, I always look for parental leave and, and adoption leave uh, rather than uh, maternal uh, and paternal leave uh, kind of deals because that's who I am. I'm a queer Jew. Uh, I'm a non-binary queer Jew. So looking for that kind of thing when I come in, that tells me I'm accepted. So the same thing with, with Jewish holidays, like how do I get those off? How do I, do I have to go through a process that has to be approved? Or can I say, you know, this is when I need to be off. Can I leave at four o'clock on Fridays in the winter? Um, those are the kinds of things that that I really look for uh, in a policy. Yeah, uh, I know when I worked in corporate, we had vacation days and then personal days, um, which was like two days, which is a compromise for a lot of Jews to take only two days of our holidays off. Um, but this is the world that we live in. So sometimes you take what you can get and you choose which days are the most important, like maybe Rosh Hashanah, maybe Yom Kippur, maybe the first day of Passover, whatever your observance is. Um, but knowing that there was, I could take a personal day off and not have to go into my vacation was important. And yeah, it, it's definitely something you can look at while you're in the hiring process even and be like, okay, so what sort of time off do you have? What is your, what is your policy on leave? Do you have anything written about like religious observance? Um, that kind of stuff. 
Uh, other things that, that you can do are um, just to, to, I lost my train of thought. I apologize. <laughs> um, yes. So anyone else? Oh, I just want to say that also in asking for the days that you need to ask what you for what you need, because some people do not observe all the Jewish holidays in the way that other people observe all the Jewish holidays. And there are days that are, for, if you are an observant Jew, you don't work, you don't drive, not just, you know, not just on the first day of the Jewish New Year, but on the second day. And and then the following week, it's, you know, Yom Kippur. And then the following, there's, there's two more weeks and there's the following week. So, you know, when you're in university or in a work, especially if you're in a new workplace to be forward and say, hey, there's, you know, not only can I not make a four o'clock meeting on a Friday, but mm -hmm. because, but the idea of accommodation is not unfamiliar to people in the workplace. I think it's the idea of Jewish accommodation. And I also think that, you know, in, I, I want to point to a question that I saw come up that there's a lot more similarities between religion than difference. And then if we're talking about Jewish observance and practice, um, cultural and also religious, there are so many similarities between groups that we try and pit against each other that we're choosing Islam over Judaism or Judaism over Islam. And the truth is they're cousins and there's their compliments and there's a reflection in the practice and in the calendar year. And I think that understanding both um, actually all religious levels of, of observance and all religious, all cultural practice just generally builds respect among communities and workplaces. So, you know, in one way, asking a question um, may at first seem awkward and uncomfortable because you don't want to ask something that seems like I'm prying. But if the place is open enough, you can ask the questions to allow to create community. Um, and I think that's ultimately the goal is to create a community. And if I could just add one more thing, I think it's it's a healthy exercise, as Jody was saying, for organizations to kind of look at who's excluded by by when company or organizational programming happens. It isn't just accommodating a person individually. It's when is the rest of your, whether it's a an evening celebration, who may be excluded by that time, and even looking at food and drink and, and kind mm -hmm. of how is a celebration centered around food and drink and who does that exclude? Mm -hmm. uh, because there's there's exclusionary overlap here that applies to people even outside of Judaism. Uh, one of my mentors once said, uh, if your organization um, can get your food order right, uh, that's the first step to understanding diversity. Do you have vegetarians? Do you have gluten-free? Do you have folks who are kosher, halal? And what do you do when you have that office lunch? I'm not sure how appropriate that is now that we it's post-COVID, but uh, that's, you know, you are accommodating people at these steps and it takes these little steps and it goes for all communities because again, when you have these welcoming policies, when you have these uh, holiday, um, uh, you know, uh, blocks of time, this goes forward for every community. It's not just about supporting one community or, and as Shiba said, there is no competing uh, uh, who gets the rights. Um, because we're all looking for a place that values us, that uh, puts their time in us, and that listens to us. I'm just uh, taking a look here at the time. We've got about five minutes left, so I'd like to open up the floor to anyone. Does anyone have any summary uh, or, or some conclusion or um, just something we might not have covered so far uh, that you'd like to, to let everyone know about? Mm. I mean, we've already covered it a bit, but just including learning about anti-Semitism in your EDI or DEI efforts is important. Um, and include other forms of oppression that you might not have thought of as well, because learning about the other in any capacity is always great for engendering empathy and compassion. And you make a better community when you can um, have more of both of those. <laughs> So um, I think that's really what's important. Agreed. 
Um, if I could just say, if, if you're looking to do some learning, learning about different kinds of Jews, um, my family is from Ethiopia, and um, a, a term you may have heard is, is Falasha. I actually saw someone ask it in the chat. It's actually a derogatory term used towards Ethiopian Jews, um, a term that they were called stranger when persecuted in Ethiopia. So, so that's an added dimension that people often don't recognize when they're talking about Ethiopian Jews. So um, that that's that's all I if I could if I could leave you with one thing it's that there's there's probably just more to the story than than we already know about. Jody, oh, I would I I don't think I'm going to say anything that hasn't been covered already, but I do want to um, ask people to um, actually I'll take it back to the beginning. I know that we talked about the IRA definition. I know that people get uncomfortable with um, examples because it does mention Israel. Ask people about it. Uh, come back to us. Look at it. You learn about it. And adopting it, adopting the definition in the workplace, I know is sometimes difficult, um, but it allows for the beginning of a conversation. And it allows for you to understand how to define it. Um, and I think feeling able to feel seen is important and so if you can know that there is something like this this tool that exists for the beginning of a conversation to exist then please take that step excellent i i i'm i know from this i'm going to take away um to to reach out when i when i'm working with my partners here at the ccdi is being an ally uh there's nothing different uh, nothing exceptional about being an ally to any one community that you can't transfer to most others. Uh, the best thing you can do is educate yourself and listen when folks bring up uh, issues. And that's what I want to take away from this today is that we can all be allies. That you can do by deciding that you can help, that you can listen, and that you can do the research yourself um, and not always putting it on the Jew. Um, the person of color in your office, the um, uh, person the, of another religion, you don't have to put this on them to do the work. You can listen and learn. Uh, and when you have that mentality of the continuous learning, I think that's what's going to take you the furthest in being an accepting um, workplace. So I just want to say thank you very much to Ziv, Shiva, and Jody today. Uh, you all brought some fantastic information. You all have your own special specialties that all worked so well uh, in bringing this forward. And I just want to give you the, the biggest thanks and pat on the back that I can virtually do from Halifax. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank, thank you for putting it together. Thank you. All right. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation. For more information on upcoming events, please visit our website at ccdi.ca.